Tarde, a todos. Deixa eu só mudar aqui o meu, o meu idioma para o chinês. Boa tarde. Mais um encontro do Tiaços. Penúltimo encontro do Tiaços deste ano. Né? Vai se aproximando do final do ano. Nós teremos mais um encontro ainda. Esse é o da Eva. Daqui a três semanas com o Lawrence Hillman. É... E hoje a gente vai ter a grata e feliz ocasião de poder receber Eva Pat Zoya, uma figura extremamente importante, simpat... simpaticíssima. Obrigado pelo teu... pela generosidade de você ter aceito o convite, Eva. É... A questão do Sand Play, de alguma maneira, está muito associada ao nome da Eva que vem realizando nos últimos anos um trabalho bastante particular e singular com o uso do sand play em comunidades vulneráveis, na sua clínica. E hoje a gente vai ter a oportunidade de poder testemunhar, escutá-la e conversar com ela sobre a sua prática, a sua experiência. Vou fazer a apresentação formal da Eva. É... Eva é psicóloga clínica e psicanalista junguiana para adultos e crianças. Ela é membro funda fundadora da OGAP, membro da Associação de Pós-Graduação em Psicologia Analítica, da CIPA, Centro Italiano de Psicologia Analítica, e também da Associação de Psicologia Analítica de Nova York. Ela é diplomada em terapia sand play pela Associação Internacional de Terapia de sand play com duas atividades de ensino de sand play no Instituto C.G. Jung em Zurich, na Fundação C.G. Jung em Nova York, em Viena, em Lindauer, uh, e desenvolveu sua prática clínica privada em Viena. E desde 2002, ela ensina e participa em treinamentos da IAP para grupos também de desenvolvimento em Hong Kong, em Buenos Aires. Ela é membro fundadora da Associação Internacional de Sand Work Expressivo, uma organização sem fins lucrativos que organiza projetos de sand play terapia em áreas onde a psicoterapia não está disponível. A Eva tem quatro livros, né? Terapia Sand Play, o tratamento das psicopatologias, que é um livro de 2002, Terapia Sand Play em comunidades vulneráveis, pela Rutles, 2011, Aborto, Perda e Renovação, pela Ruthless, e Onde a Alma Encontra a Matéria, pela Kiron, 2020. Eva, prazer enorme te receber, é uma alegria ter você conosco, fico feliz de você ter aceito o nosso convite. É... Já recebemos Luiz de Zoya, gostaríamos muito de convidar você, fico feliz da sua gentileza de poder estar conosco e tenho certeza que a gente vai ter um, uma, um belo encontro. Por favor, senta-se à vontade, a casa é sua, tá? Posso só dar um avisinho antes? Claro. Quem estiver que, precisando da tradução, é, onde vocês estão lendo chinês, entendam-se português. <risos> Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me in Chinese? Do you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Marcos, for this nice presentation. I'm very happy with this uh, uh, joyful feeling from the beginning. Um, I would like to divide this lecture in three parts, and these three parts reflect my three areas where um, I think I did explored and developed something special in the Jungian field. The areas are, areas are different, and uh, one is adult sound play therapy, individual setting, The second is a project in schools, a social project with dreams. 
And the third is what Marcus has mentioned, the expressive sound work in uh, vulnerable communities. So these three areas will be the three parts of this lecture now. The first part, I will not show any images. The second and the third part, you will see then when we share the screen, I will show you some pictures. Let's begin with the first part, clinical work with adults in scent therapy. Um, the focus of this approach I have developed in the last years was um, about pre-symbolic representation in sound play. We have the symbolic level, which is the miniature and the symbols, but we have also a pre-symbolic level. And for me, this is the most deep level of sound play therapy because we access very early stages of human development and of our infancy. So we get back to very regressed states and it's there where things change. Um, so by pre-symbolic, I mean deep psychic structures that influence a person's life and that namely very quickly represented in the sand if you have a free and protected environment. So uh, in order not to mean abstract, here is an example. Exactly 35 years ago, I came to my first sun play session to Dora Kalf in her house in Zolikon. Very mysterious old house. Dora Kalf is the founder of sun play therapy, as you say, at least with adults. And so I came to this house, I went down the steps, the wooden steps, entered the room. And um, from the first moment, I really felt that free and protected atmosphere. I really felt I can do whatever I want. And this was a wonderful feeling. Dora Kalf was sitting beside me. And then I began to touch the sand and do something with this sand in front of me. And then began my dilemma. There was too much sand in the box for me, too much. So I asked, can I take some sand out because it's too much, it was heavy and it was disturbing me. I was allowed to take some sand out. Then I did it and it felt relief. Then I saw there was too little sand left. Everything was so thin and so poor. So I thought, oh my God, it's too, too little sand. So I put the sand back again. And there was again too much. And out again. And there was too little. So um, Dora Kalf <laughs> sat there silently accompanying my inner drama about too much and not enough. And this is a deep issue, which I struggle today with the same thing. This is a deep structure. And you can see it also in my lecture, I have or too much or not enough. You will see it also today. So just to tell you how deep the sand uh, speaks to you about your deep structures from the beginning, from the first minutes. That I mean with pre-symbolic. It, it's not about the image, it's about an experience of yourself, which is, is very strong. And so pre-symbolic means also a developmental phase in which there are no images, but uh, predominantly sensory impressions like physical presence in space. You might feel warm or cold, soft or hard, wide or narrow, pleasant or unpleasant. These are the perceptions, the sensory perceptions, which the sound um, provokes. 
so it can happen if you offer to the clients just sand and water then um, the client can concentrate only on the sense of touch and no visual images may arise and it allows the client to go to a kind of trance-like state of waking consciousness and gradually the hand begin to move as if they have a life of their own as they would guide the process the instruction for such a session for your client and you can do it if you are an analyst or also if you are a therapist of other uh, schools of therapy you could use more or less these instructions um, please if you want to go to sit in front of the sandbox uh, this is not an exercise of doing of creating of making something it is an exercise of perception you can put your hands in the sand you can close your eyes and listen and feel what your hands want to do how they are how they feel and what they really would like and if a images comes up in your mind and you want to make a scene in the sound play leave it for a moment aside and don't follow it but just focus back on the palms of your hand and let the hand do what they need what they want this would be more or less the instruction and then it happens that the client might say stay with the hands on the sand maybe just resting or maybe being buried down for a long long time nothing will happen and you are just there with your client and the hands have a chance to show what they really want so another rhythm uh, arises and also a very slowness comes upon and you have an atmosphere of listening instead of doing and that's really uh, what we are looking for listening perceiving instead of doing so in this way uh sensations in the face of the very early childhood can be activated through this through the hands it's a phase in the uh, evolution of of uh, the psyche which has been described like daniel stern in his diary of a baby you might know it daniel stern speaks of intensity contours such as strong weak uniform violent swelling flowing fading this is what a, a very small baby perceives and this corresponds exactly to what the patients described in this type of kinesthetic imagination we can call it kinesthetic means uh perceptual movement the word goes back to the ancient greek word kineo move and aesthesis perceive and daniel stern again calls a preliminary stage of consciousness core self michael fordham calls it primary self Antonio Damasio, the neuroscientist, calls it proto-self. It's all stages where the sensorial are uh, priority. Today, mm, we look for more for the similarities than the differences in the views of these researchers. For us, it's really important to have an idea how it is when inside world and outside world are together are not yet distinguished that's not so easy to imagine but we all have had this stage and there is a german 
a poet who puts it very nicely in his childhood memories. This poet's name is Adalbert Stifter, uh, German from the 800, Adalbert Stifter. And he says about his very, very early childhood, I remember dark spots in my own inner world of which I understood only much later that there were the woods outside of me. He remembers dark spots and discovered later these were the woods. So he describes exactly a memory where inside and outside were not yet distinguished. They were the same thing. And if we imagine this, you know, what it means for a small baby that the primary caretaker, the mother, is within, uh, this means if this mother disappears, it's really a crash. Everything disappears because it's inside from which the mother disappears, not from outside. And, and that we should have in mind. And we know this description of inner void which adult patients uh, tell us. It's an inner void because the inner primary caretaker has disappeared. So I think it's important to keep in mind what it means inside and outside is the same thing. And uh, Neumann, Erich Neumann also describes this. And he said, this is a stage where the ego consciousness is not yet detached from his being contained bigger universal containment. And then when the detachment begins, when the ego is moving out of this whole being contained, we assume it's between three months of life or eight months of life at the uh, age of the child. Um, here, uh, hand in hand with the self-awareness of the person itself, of the baby itself, it also comes the presence, the conscious presence of the other. It's the moment where I feel myself and I feel also there is another one there, you know? So we have this distinction. And in this moment, the attachment styles are developing. Attachment studied by John Bowlby. Uh, you might all know about this. It is when we, how we relate to the other, to the first caretaker. And um, for a long time, the secure and unsecure attachment were regarded as hardly changeable. Also, the scientists, the research was mainly interested in how it comes to this attachment style and that attachment style. But there was a lot of insecurity and perplexity about the therapeutic approach. What do we do with these attachment styles of unsecure attachment, of disorganized attachment? And the idea that attachment style could be represented and also changed with the help of symbolic processes were not yet there. And we, we must say the sound play therapists, had already observed in the sound boxes of the very beginning, Margaret Lowenfeld's uh, sound boxes in the 30s and Dora Kalf's sound in the 60s. From that on, we saw that, for instance, a child would put some miniatures who had no eye contact with each other. And after some session, there would be two animals who look to each other, who are in relation. And that for us was always the first milestone of a process of recuperating attachment and a secure attachment. Relationship begins on the symbolic level in the sound tray. And that immediately will be transformed also in the uh, behavior of the child. So, just a small example, 
there was a child in Colombia, a very uh, vulnerable child in a very difficult social situation. He had no parents. It was living on the street, had no kind of uh, positive experience of being cared for. And this child put in the sun tray a little stroller with a small baby in the stroller. And then it put a stone beside this stroller and the baby. And the six-year-old boy said, this stone takes care of the baby. So you can see the child is like accessing archetypal energy of mothering at the level of materia, of stone, but still the stone uh, is the beginning of a taking care model, which came from himself. He had no, not been taken care by anybody. But this is what Jung says, the self-regulating process of the psyche. If there is a safe and protected space, then the psyche will produce that thing, regulate itself, accessing archetypal energies to activate the care system. We know the care system also from the neuroscientist Jak Panksepp, who has written about affective neuroscience, you might know it. And the care system is one of the seven systems which can be activated. Other systems are fear, are anger, and so are play. But the care system is archetypal and genetically programmed in us. So uh, we have Bolby, we have Jung, and we can say that what uh, we observe is really true because we observe the consequences of the child's behavior. We can see that after some sun play sessions, not even so many, the children change the social behavior of themselves. So it's, it's not about only uh, their dreams or their um, inner world. It's really the social behavior towards other children, which we see. And that is confirmed by teachers, by social workers. And they always wonder why could a child who's placed in the sandbox by himself, why is the child then more open to other children and interested in other children and is able for social uh, contacts? As depth psychologists, we are not surprised because we know exactly how closely social competence and intrapsychic dynamics are connected. Now, back to our us adults, where attachment styles are more inscribed deeply in psyche and body and patterns are very strong. And patients would tell us, oh, it's stronger than me. I cannot change it. Again, it happened to me, the same pattern. And as therapists, we could decide not to deal with the symptom, but we could look in the biography of the client, uh, a psychological state, which is before the attachment styles, which are models, which are, are rigid. So there was a phase before the attachment style, that phase, what I told you before, deeply a regressed phase where uh, there was still this inner and outer world altogether. And that phase we, we can reach through sound play in some situations. So it is very worthwhile for the analyst to offer only sand and water in the first sun play sessions. And that gives the patient the opportunity to perceive that very small unintentional movement impulses, I told you before. And we don't know the meaning or their goal. We just follow them. For example, some patients experience that the sound feels unexpectedly inviting. And they might say, hard to believe the sound re responds to me, said one patient, when he gently caressed the surface. 
And when I saw it, to me as a therapist, her movement felt like she was caressing, touching skin. So softly she caressed the sand. And after a while, she looked at me with a big smile and said, I would have wanted to be caressed like this. So the patient had experienced how doing and experiencing subject and object coincide. While she was caressing, stroking the end, she also was being caressed by herself. Such an experience already touches on this primordial uh, sensation, bodily sensation. And uh, we also see that people who came in, into the world as premature babies often feel an unpleasant coldness at the first touch of the sand. Such a strong coldness that they really recoil and are a, li a little bit scared. It seems like the self-regulating function of this psyche would want to um, make emerge this dramatic beginning of relationship to the world because the baby was born premature and to raise it into consciousness because the cold comes back from that face and the unpleasant contact with the sun is dealt with in different ways than by the client. Some people turn away from the sand and get really scared and would not want to, to continue. And then we talk about it. A lot of pain can emerge. Issues ranging from abandonment, exposure, until fear of that. Uh, and really unpleasant things which can be talked through without touching the scent anymore. Other clients find their immediate physical readiness for resilience. And for example, one client, he had this cold feeling immediately. And then he had the idea of warming the sand with his hands. So the entire first session passed the men taking all the sand of the sandbox up to the corners, every place into his hand and warming it one after the other, warming it. It took a long time. And since the sand actually gets warmer by touch, this activity was extraordinarily satisfying for him. To me, it seemed like a healing ceremony. I was just watching how he warmed the whole sand of the whole sandbox. It was very moving. In the verbal part of the session, we came to talk about his childhood. He had been in an incubator for two months as a premature baby. And he was very moved by the reference to a possible connection with the cold he had experienced immediately with the sand. But he was even more moved by the fact that the idea to warm the sand so long time had come all by himself. That impressed him the most, that he had the idea how to deal with it. And he has created the warmth uh, to compensate the cold of his beginning of life. So you can see the psyche again, if you provide a safe and free container, will come out with resilience and with uh, emerging solutions even. So this um, touching the sand, you know, and getting to another level of consciousness can be done very easily uh, in therapy sessions without wanting to go so deep. For instance, if you see a client whose hands are nervously twitching and sweating and cramping in each other, you know, we know many patients who do like this during the sessions and you can see the hands are really wanting uh, to participate. So I would say this, I say, it seems that your hands want to participate in what we are talking. And so uh, you can invite a patient to sit in front of the sandbox 
continuing the verbal analysis and just say, so the hand has something to do. So while we talk, the hand can touch the sound and do something in the sound. And what happens normally is a quantum leap in self-awareness. The patient continues to speak, but the way of speaking has changed. The voice normally is deeper. The tone is calmer. The words are even better chosen. There are pauses. There is time. It is like someone listens to himself for the first time. And with the help of the touch of the sand, a new dialogical inner space is opened. And this is really very important for people with panic attacks because they lack such an inner space. And if they listen to themselves and can talk to themselves, then they have created an inner space of me and you, a dialogical space. For instance, uh, in a panic attack, they might then say to themselves the next time, oh, your heart is beating wildly and you don't have more saliva in your mouth. Let's make ourselves a cup of tea and we, then we will see. This is a relational space has emerged inside a client, uh, I and you, we, we together, me and me. And that's exactly what begins sometimes if you only touch the sand. And this first sensed you can really be also the sensitivity of the sand. The sand is the first you which can be accepted by a client who has a avoidant attachment, for instance, or a disorganized attachment, who would not accept a therapist as you because the therapist would be scary, would be avoided, would, would cause a lot of problems for the client. So deeply, he would not connect with the therapist. But the client can connect with the sand. And so he can reach this you through the sand. And later, it will be the same thing which happens with the therapist. I'm just thinking, um, Marcus, how much time do we have? Because I'm try to, to think of what I include and what I not include. So now it's one quarter to nine. Yeah, how much time do we have? A gente tem uma hora para você falar. Então, fica à vontade. Não se preocupa muito com o tempo, tá? Você decide. How many minutes? O tempo que você quiser. Uh, but we, we, yeah. Okay, but we um, began very late, so we should more have more than 20 minutes. But it's fine if I can do it in 20 minutes. Yes, exactly. That, that's what I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe I will come to my second part, the project in schools, because uh, we can maybe later in the discussion come back to this sample the primary level. You know, I think that's fine what we said until now. Now comes the second part. And in the second part, I will um, share the screen. Yes, now, do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, do you see the picture and me down? Yes. But I cannot hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Yes. Anyway. Okay. okay, wonderful. Now we go. Um, this is a project, it's done in schools. I have developed it um, 
based on Jung's uh, idea of self-regulating. The psyche is a system of self-regulation. And the project is about telling dreams in the classroom. So we know that um, dreams are compensatory to the daily consciousness. It is Jung's idea. Whatever we uh, are not aware in our daily consciousness, the dream will bring us. And that's why the dreams are so uh, strange, so paradoxical and so embarrassing sometimes. And they are uh, never reductive to dreams. And so since the dreams add to our consciousness, not don't think, the dreams are the opposite of reductive attitudes. So polarization in our consciousness, like we and the others or normal and not normal uh, in the dreams are not possible because the dreams are complex, absurd, and many times they are really embarrassing. So um, we know that this openness is very important also in childhood because we can see already some children in the kindergarten who have a polarized attitude and they will include some children and exclude some other children. And that is really uh, gives us a lot of concern. And so it would be very interesting for the children to have access to their dreams in the classroom because that would allow them to develop more openness to the unknown, more curiosity to what they don't know. So it's a really psycho hygiene uh, topic. Uh, this is um, what I will go quickly now. This is a um, German poet, what he says about dream. We go on. Um, this is interesting, a book about dreams. Charlotte Berat, she has written a book of dreams in the years in Germany of 1933 and 1945. In this period of Nazism, she has collected all the dreams. And um, there is one dream in the book about dreaming. And this dream says, I dream that I dream only about rectangles, triangles, and octagons because now it is forbidden to dream at all. That means there are extreme socio-political conditions through which dreaming itself is suppressed and the regulation function of the dreaming is cancelled, nullified. And so the question arises, could something similar happen today? Not by a totalitarian regime as then, but maybe because of the invasion of screens of virtual images in the uh, childhood rooms, children's room. So this is a drawing of a dream of a child who had no dream today. As psychotherapists, we can confirm what Elias Canetti told us. He says, Everything that is forgotten cries out for help in dreams. I repeat, everything that is forgotten cries out for help in dreams. But what if nothing cries out for help anymore because remembering the dreams themselves is forgotten? This was the, the conceptual basis where we started in a school in Italy, South Italy, in the year 2014. And 130 children were allowed to 
tell their dreams within the school lessons and the class teachers listen to them. The dream lesson, my night book, took place once a week from the second to fifth grade. The children were always uh, allowed to listen to the dream of the others, draw them, write them, or also whisper the dream in the ear of the teacher. That was the possibilities. And each uh, dream drawing would be put in a folder. And these folder were nicely decorated by the children. And for each year, each child had such a folder. And this project went on for four years. So after four years, the children had four folders with all the dream each week of a drawing or a telling of the dream. Now I will show you some examples of the drawings. There are dreams of pure joy, like this one. There are dreams of anxiety and, and difficult fear. Then a lot of grieving work is done in the dreams. And if you imagine a whole class, all the children listen to the dream and participate at the grieving. It's so important for the children that the grief can be given some space. A lot of uh, animals that, for instance, is the grieving, but of course it's symbolically more deeper for the child. Then we have also some relational uh, attachment uh, themes here. The child says to the little bear, Oh, what are you doing in this cold place, you little bear? So taking care happens in the dream. Again, the archetypal way of taking care. Then we have other dreams. Incidents here, the um, child said, I dreamed that my brother hit his head and that a lot of blood came out of his head. And we are not interested here in whether the dreamed experiences are to be understood concretely, metaphorically, or symbolically. We stay with the phenomenon. This is our attitude. And from the teacher's point of view, cognitive skills improve, especially linguistic and social skills. And uh, interesting if you think, um, what is entirely one's own experience, such an intimate thing like the dream, is recognized inside, and therefore the child is very open to recognize also the very intimate world of the other child. And it can be shown fearlessly, its own intimacy and the other intimacy is accepted. And this has an effect of strengthening the identity. A child from Albania, there were a lot of migrant families in the school who had not told the dream for two months and had only listened to the dreams of the other children. At the end of the school year, when he was asked, uh, did you like, did you enjoy the dream lesson and what you, did you like about it? And he said, I had never thought that Italian children also had such terrible dreams. I was convinced that I'm the only one to having awful dreams. Now, children really love to tell their difficult dreams and sometimes they feel a relief and say, oh, now I have said it. And the relief uh, connects to all the children, also the ones who only are listening or seem absent, keeping their eyes closed sometimes, but they are contained in the whole atmosphere of the class and also they develop a primal trust, like a collective attachment experience, again. And we can 
learn from the parents of the children. They say that children are more open. They connect better to their feelings. For instance, a child said to his mother for the first time in his life, he said, now I need a hug. So they are more aware of the feelings and can express them better. Anyway, some children had no dream at all. And they were the children who stayed a lot of time in front of virtual uh, screens. And we said to them, you can draw whatever drawing you want. You can draw also your place where you sleep. These were the drawings of the children who had no dreams at all for weeks or months. This is another one. You recognize what it is, you know, in a PlayStation. Another drawing of a six-year-old about a PlayStation. It's many hours a day. This one. So it really seems as the virtual images have repressed the inner images of the dreams. So the dreams really could not emerge. This is really a big concern we have today. But after some months, also those children dreamt. And um, I think because of the activation of the collective atmosphere of the whole class, of the whole group of other children, also those children dreamt and had um attention to their dreams and um after the four years some children gave some feedback what it meant for them to be part of the dreaming project and one child said in the morning i was often frightened by my nightmares when i was little four years ago and then i drew them and they were no longer so bad Another child says, the others can't judge me because of a dream. It is important to tell the dreams to free oneself for the, from the bad thoughts. Another child, during all these years, I have thought the treasure chest, the folder, is like a faithful friend who keeps all my secrets. Okay, this was the second part, and uh, we have still time for the third parts because it's not so much, but uh, it's always the same topic. The topic is self-regulating uh, principle of the psyche, which is uh, what Jung says, and these other projects you might have uh, read about it or known it, which we call expressive sound work in vulnerable communities where we um, offer the children to play in the sand in a group. Each child has its own facilitator. This is where we have the projects. And the latest project is in Ukraine, which is not here. And I'm so proud and very moved to say that today, expressive sound work is done in Bucha near Kiev. You remember Bucha, where all the atrocities in Ukraine has happened, the civilians being murdered. And our colleagues in different places in Ukraine do expressive sound work. I will show it to you later. So um, these are the founders of the expressive sound work, as you know. And this is how it happens. There is a facilitator for each child. Each child has a sandbox. Each child has a miniatures to choose from. It's culturally re relevant miniatures. And this is the setting. Oh, wait. Uh, maybe I have not here the setting. Let me see. This is Africa. We will skip this. Um, this is kind of a setting in Africa. You can see this was the biggest group we had. So all the sound trays, one facilitator, one child sitting in front of it, and 
uh, allow, being allowed to take the miniatures and make his own three-dimensional representation of whatever he wants to play. This is just the idea and the principle. You see, this is Colombia. It's this. This is the setting. You see on the wall, there are the sandboxes with the facilitators, which are not psychologists. They are volunteers, teachers, uh, people in retirement, social workers, and uh, the children are playing. Weekly sessions. This is another setting, which is uh, also in Colombia. And uh, you can see that, I just show you this also from Colombia. You can see that at the same, in the same sandbox, there is the problem, the civil war of Colombia, the fighting, but there is also the resilience. You can see this Buddha meditating. This is spontaneous picture of a child who represents uh, the conflict and already emerging some resilience. We see this all the time. Again, self-regulating principle of the psyche, what Jung said. This is again Colombia. I just want to show you a little bit the environment. And this, as you know, was the civil war of 50 years, uh, which has caused uh, to the children and to the population uh, suffering, which is inimaginable. But we don't see only these lines of soldiers. We have also lines of volunteers in a very um, difficult environment. This is in Medellin, Colombia, where the volunteers uh, proposed sand work since many years. These are the children who look for the miniatures. And this is the representation we see in the sandboxes. It's violence, a lot of violence, violence to women, symbolically represented, represented. You see the dinosaur, the primitive force, you know, is taking the woman. So the children exactly um, represent what's in their life, what they see, what they witness. Violence with babies. You see, this is a stroller and a small baby. And this is a black figure putting his hands on the baby. It's very, very explicit and very hard to, to deal with. Mm. Also, this is uh, many children have seen murders of in front of their eyes. They were witnessed. They cannot talk to the uh, parents about that, and so they keep silent. But in the sound work, immediately it will be shown what they have seen, what they have witnessed. So also that comes out. And then you have also themes of resilience, of uh, shelter. You can see this is the other part, being contained, being safe, or community sharing food, being nurtured. This is also what we see in the same children from the same environment. So we can always see there is the very, very profound problems and a very profound healing too. I will skip now another part or will it, maybe I will do it quickly just to show you another place where we have work. This is the Yazidi population. You remember this is the genocide of 2014 where the Yazidi population was uh, slaughtered by Islamic State. You remember that, 3 August 2014. Um, and we have worked with um, refugees in Germany for the Yazidi who has fled to Germany. 2000 women was brought to Germany. We have worked with the children in that shelter in Germany, in Stuttgart. These are the Jungian colleagues of the Jung Institute in Stuttgart. Stuttgart, these are the cities where we worked with the children, refugees' children. 
And they, of course, represented all the horrible things which had happened to them. And uh, again, difficult to, to bear for the facilitators, these representations. But also, again, you know, there is the resilience, which also is shown. And then comes the next chapter. I was uh, called to Ukraine in 2016 in the Donbas area. I worked with many, many colleagues there. And I remember when it was in the Donbas, they showed me the destruction already there. In these cities, which we know today, Prokovsk, Popasnaya, um, in, in that area, and they showed me the destruction, and I had a feeling they wanted to tell me, look, this is what is happening, this is what they are doing to us. And I felt so much that they thought I would not believe them. They were afraid I would not take it seriously enough. So they insisted to show me the shellings and the destruction. And they were right. We did not believe them enough. We did not take them so seriously. They were right at that time in 2016 about what happened next. And we did sampling in Donbass, in the Kiev. You can see what the children again expressed already at that time. And you see also, again, the small sign of resilience. Here you see the uh, helping Red Cross package. This is what we see in a big picture. I go back, you can see big pictures of fighting, fighting. The child did 11 sun trays with only fighting like this. And then in the last one, he put just that little piece. And that's resilience and the child did sleep better, he was had not any more headache and stomach ache and felt better. So this is again what happens, you know, if you give a space, if you let a child express, then this will uh, emerge. Um, then it, this was the place where in 2000, from 2016, 2022, sand play sound work was happening in this building. And this is the building today in 2022. We have lost all the miniatures, all the sound boxes, uh, and the people had to flee. This is the same building today. Then we did a project in Milan for the Ukrainian refugees. The lady here, blonde, uh, is Oksana from Kiev. She has fled to Milan and we did, uh, these are all Jungian analysts. We did a sound work for the small group of Ukrainian children in June. And again, you can see what the children represent. And again, you can see some resilience. You know, the sunflowers are a symbol of Ukraine and the sunflowers are always following the sun. They are directed to the sun. So it's the conflict, but it's also the relief. And I would like to show you a picture which is from yesterday from the Ukraine where the colleagues do the sand play in Bucha which is close to Kiev and they have no electricity now as you know from the news so they do the sand work even without electricity and you can see the miniatures there are coffins sunflowers different things. 
but they do it even without electricity and in, in the cold. Sandburg is there. So I think it's, it's, the colleagues are really happy that you witness it, that you know it, that you look at it, what they are doing now. And this is what a child said uh, after a sand play process. When I am grow up, I want to be a sand doctor too. This is how the children call it. It was the idea of the child to call it a sand doctor. I thank you very much for listening to me and uh, I'm happy if you want to talk or to share or whatever you would like. I stop share the screen and we are back. Eva, super obrigada pela tua palestra. Nossa, é, fica até difícil falar agora, depois de tantas imagens. Eu nem sei que palavras falar. É, me bateu até corporalmente mesmo assistir essas imagens. Bom, a gente começa o debate agora. Para quem conseguir fazer alguma, algum comentário, alguma pergunta, é, coloca no chat, eu vou chamar. É, Bom, foram me surgindo algumas questões aí ao longo, é, eu vou ficar com as últimas questões que me, me surgiram com as imagens, e aí depois, se der, eu volto para as primeiras questões que eu fiquei. É, eu fiquei pensando assim, é, nesse, nesse trabalho que vocês fazem, você chamou de facilitador as, os, as pessoas que estão lá com as, nas caixas de areia, diferente de um, de, do papel de um psicólogo no consultório. Né? Então, eu queria entender um pouco o que os facilitadores fazem né, nesse trabalho e, 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 assim, bom, a partir dessa resposta eu viria a próxima, mas eu já vou emendar, porque, assim, a impressão que eu fiquei é que a caixa de areia trabalha num nível inconsciente, que não é preciso de interpretação, não é preciso de alguém lá falando o que está tá acontecendo lá na caixa de areia. Eu queria que você me falasse um pouquinho uhum. sobre isso, se, é, se, se é, a minha percepção foi correta. Yes, totally. Uh, thank you for your first perception. It affects us on the body. You know, it affects you, it affects me, it affects the facilitator all the time, very much on the body. And this is already some answer of your question. So the instruction to the facilitator is not to say anything, not only not to interpret, but not to say anything, not comment, not make question, nothing. Only if the child asks something, the facilitator will respond, but he will not go on with some deeper, some questions or whatever. So it's a silent witnessing, empathic witnessing. And the instruction for the facilitator is also to be aware of his perception, body, psychic thoughts, emotion, write it down, what he feels, and that will be shared afterwards in the group in the intervision we call it intervision not supervision so uh, you are perfectly right there is no need for the interpretation because what the child shows it's already so much emotionally um, intense for the child so it has to be processed by the child itself in the next session next session we only need to continue. We cannot do it twice or three times. It has to be a continuation in time, at least eight or 12 sessions. We prefer more, but eight is the minimum what we are doing now. And so you're right. That's why we can also uh, make use of volunteers, not trained people or very shortly training because we are always in the group. And nobody can do strange things of talking or making questions or whatever. So uh, it's always safe, exactly because we don't uh, intervene. And the children work in silence. There is silence, you know, and they love it to, to be silent. 
Ah, obrigada, Eva. Tem uma pergunta da Eliette que acho que junta aqui com a minha, né? Aquela pergunta como são é, preparados os facilitadores, é isso? É isso. Eu gostaria de saber como os voluntários são preparados. Yeah, first I want to tell you that uh, my colleague from Colombia, who has a lot, many years experience with Sandwork, she is um, negotiating a training in Brazil. So I don't know exactly, but I will tell you, she is doing it for Brazil. Uh, she had nearly ready the project. And the training is um, like one weekend intensive training. And then you learn by doing it with a weekly intervention, you know, so the, the volunteers are followed in the first project by somebody who does it online or in presence. But it's a very short training at the beginning, like one weekend. And then the person has to be in the project for eight weeks. And this is the learning. It's very minimalistic. It's very learning by doing. Uh, and it's very much the group, you know, everything happens in the group. This is more or less the training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the group functions as an alchemical vessel, you know, it's, it's really intensifying the process because the group is very close, very sealed. Uh, we have a lot of rules uh, in this group. Nobody can observe, you know, nobody can be half inside, outside. It's very strict what, how we do the setting, very strict setting, very strict setting and very much free um, liberty and being free in the sandbox. So this is mm -hmm. opposite things, you know, the, the protection must be very strong. And then there is the... the freeness inside the contents, the unconscious, because it's the unconscious which unfolds. Mm -hmm. mm. Tá certo. Marcos, você quer fazer uma pergunta? Oi, Eva. Nossa, fiquei bastante impressionado também com as imagens, Eva. É, imagino particularmente essa experiência na Ucrânia, marcada por um antes e depois da guerra, como isso deve ter sido impactante para todos vocês. Eva, é, uma questão que eu estou pensando aqui, é, que me parece que há um, há um lugar em comum entre o trabalho feito nas escolas e nas comunidades vulneráveis. É, é, a, a minha dúvida é o seguinte, não necessariamente a ideia do sand play na escola e nas comunidades vulneráveis é produzir um sentido propriamente dito, né? Quer dizer, me parece que a, a ideia, como a ideia não é interpretar, a ideia não é de que um sentido venha de fora para dentro. E aí a minha pergunta é, a aposta é que o, o próprio ato de fazer a cena, o próprio ato de deixar as mãos agirem, por si só, já se revela terapêutico? Quer dizer, o sentido está nas mãos e não, e não em algo que virá do, do terapeuta ou do voluntário ou de algum, de algum lugar de fora. O sentido está no, no próprio ato de fazer a cena? Uh, it's in a way true and also not exactly um, because the presence of the adult there, he is not interpreting, he is not putting any meaning, as you say, to the process. The process unfolds by itself, but there is a lot of implicit influence by the therapists on the child and on the process and on the relation. You know, the bo bodily presence, like a kind of mindful presence, you know, is talking to the body, the emotions, 
and even the cognitive level of the child implicitly without words. So there is not an interpretation and not a meaning on the cognitive level, but there is a lot of um, exchange on other levels, body, emotions, and sensory resonance, you know, also the, the, the resonance of the feeling. So there is an input from the therapist, but it's not on the symbolic interpretation level, it's on different levels. Is that an answer? É uma resposta. Quer dizer, o trabalho ele é independente do, do campo de relação na qual ele está inserido. É impossível, né? É isso. Uh, the, the work is dependent on the facilitator, of isso. course, totally, isso. and also in the group. You know, and it's very interesting because sometimes we have volunteers. So we have maybe one volunteer who is not so sensitive and not so empathic because we have all sorts of volunteers. So what happens? You know, one child has a volunteer who is not exactly so capable of being in resonance. and But there is a whole group who is doing the same thing, implicitly creating silence, resonance, empathic presence, like a mindful group. And that influence even that one volunteer who is maybe less talented to be connected to the child. So we have a regulating principle of the group, which is even bigger than the individual. You see, that's also very interesting. And sometimes we can even see, you know, that sometimes one child who has a volunteer who is less connected and might be distracted and not so much looking at, at the child and the sun play, that the child is searching the eyes of another facilitator, you know, because the child feels maybe that the other facilitator is more present. So also that can happen. So the importance of the group is crucial. It's not only the one-to-one, -one, but it's also the whole group. Mm -hmm. so, só para finalizar, Lu, é, a gente poderia usar essa expressão, então, de um, de um self grupal, de um self coletivo constituído desses personagens? A criança, yes. o monitor, o ambiente, o local, o prédio? Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is really the, the strong uh, thing of the expressive sound work. This is really the strength because many colleagues told me, why do you have these results in the expressive sound work? We don't have it in the individual sessions. Children do not show their trauma in the individual sessions. Why? You know, and my answer is always because of the group. It's incredible because the group that children feel like, you know, in an animal herd, you know, if there are many animals together, you feel more safe, you feel more free. You know, it's like a, on a very genetic level, you need a group to feel connected with, with, a, with a big trauma. And in the individual session, we are not able to create that kind of very intense uh, feeling contained. Hum. Perfeito, perfeito. Obrigada, Eva. É, Elza. <risos> yes, yes, I could tell you much more about Sandwork, but I hope that Maria Claudia then will introduce it in Brazil. We have it in Argentina, in Colombia, in Latin America, and now also in Chile will begin one, and also in Uruguay one is beginning. So also Brazil. Uh, so we, we we will see, and you might know more about it. Mm. Uh, então, muito obrigada, Eva, por essa brilhante apresentação. É, o que eu senti foi meu coração muito aquecido, warm, all, expandindo durante a apresentação mm -hmm. da Ucrânia, da Colômbia. E a minha pergunta, acho que você já respondeu, 
que a minha pergunta era exatamente como era o terapeuta do stand play, essa ressonância que tem no inconsciente do analista, do terapeuta de stand play com o paciente, aonde acontece toda essa transformação e, e o corpo está muito presente. E eu vi que quando você fez no coletivo, não existia um terapeuta para um é, paciente, vamos dizer, para uma criança, existiam alguns é, facilitadores. E eu fiquei com essa dúvida, como ficava essa relação que a gente aprende no stand play, tão importante que é essa ressonância. Mas eu acho que você já respondeu que esse, o self-grupal, como disse o Marcos, ou essa, essa continência que o grupo dá, que os outros, que, que eles estão vivendo o mesmo processo, acaba acontecendo essa ressonância. Se você quiser falar, ou puder falar um pouco mais dessa ressonância, eu agradeceria, se tiver mais alguma coisa para complementar, mas eu acho que você já respondeu. Yeah, you know, it's also um, kind of a trust, you know, in a self-regulation also of the group and also in the group intervision, you know, after the session with the children, the children go out, we will remove the sound trays, you know, put everything in order and then sit and talk about what happened. And also in the talking, uh, it is a very respectful Uh, talking, we will not say, I saw this in your the tray of your child, and what does, does this mean? You know, each one has its own child, his own tray, and needs to ask permission if he can say something about the other tray, you know, so it's a very respectful thing. And also, we are not doing interpretations there. Just Uh, sharing the feelings. I felt like this, you know, I felt sad, I felt uh, distracted. Today, I didn't want to be there. I felt so uh, far from everything. I felt angry. So it's really each one of the group sharing the emotions and the thoughts and the counter-transference, what we call the mm -hmm. counter-transference, just sharing it. And the other ones, Uh, are not allowed to say, yes, this reminds me of this, and maybe this means that, you know, it's just not allowed. This is the rule. So it remains also a sharing and receiving, nothing more. So it's important to keep that also very strict. If not, you get a mess of interpretations, a mess of free associations, and that's not good for the process. Mm -hmm. Ok, muito obrigada. <risos> uhum. Obrigada, Neuza. É, a Denise e a Cris fizeram alguns comentários, a Cris e a Ana fizeram alguns comentários sobre essas zonas vulneráveis aqui no Brasil. Vocês querem falar, Denise? Cris e Ana, acho que uma completou aí a outra. Oi, boa noite. <coughs> É, então, eu fiquei com muita vontade de participar de um treinamento e também de poder ser voluntária numa área é, vulnerável. Yes. Eu, eu tenho vivido, visto, muito, ouvido adolescentes que têm, é, nesse momento no Brasil, sofrido muitas ameaças por conta de, do jeito, da forma como eles são por serem homossexuais, por serem de determinados partidos. Então, eu estou vendo isso crescer no Brasil, pelo menos aonde, até onde eu estou ouvindo né, esses adolescentes. E me preocupa bastante. Eu gostaria de poder aprender né, para depois trazer para a minha cidade. Eu estou numa cidade muito pequena, em Santa Catarina. E, e isso está aparecendo muito aqui na minha cidade. Então... Eu poderia, eu gostaria de ter contato, aprender essa técnica, né? E, enfim, poder ser voluntária para depois poder aplicar também na minha cidade, né? Uhum, uhum. If you write to me, uh, I have the um, um, email. Maybe it was at the end of the of the presentation. There was this 
email so you can write and i put you in contact with maria claudia who will the, do the project but i have to say this expressive oh, yeah. artwork is mm -hmm. from h6 to h14 not more because when they get more into puberty you know they need some other talking and it's really for children but for the more adolescents i would recommend a dream a project different than this one this was also for small children so you have another kind of dream setting um so for each age we have some um, different things you know this sound work is really from we do it from six to to 14 maximum mm -hmm. Anísia, você quer fazer tua pergunta? Você tem duas perguntas aí no chat? Uhum. Maria Anísia, está aí? Ah, o áudio está ruim. Tá bom, então eu vou ler a, sua, a pergunta da Maria Anísia. Uh, vamos ver onde está... Ah, okay. Boa tarde. Há acompanhamento posterior, onde esses trabalhos voluntários são feitos? E como os terapeutas entenderam essas cenas na Ucrânia em 2016? Poderiam ser entendidas como nos sonhos, como premonitórias? Mm, no, uh, in 2016, in the Donbass, there was a war. There was a war because uh, it was called a low intensity war, but every day soldiers died and civilians were damaged. So there was a war. So the children just uh, were attended as war victims. So only the, the, the people, they fear the war would be worse and it would go on, and that's exactly what happens. But this was already a war. And uh, the problem was in that area, in that region, that the families came with the children traumatized by the war, by the bombing, by the, by the noise, came to the children's center and <coughs> said, uh, my child has some retardation in development my child is kind of retarded. And they did not even think that this could be the war trauma and they are not retarded, but they are uh, traumatized by the war. So this was very important for the, for the families to recognize what the war did already at that time. So it was not a premonition, it was a war there. And the, the, the people who did it in Kiev were refugees from Donbass. So in Ukraine, it was already there. And uh, the refugees here in Milan, they have been twice refugees. They were refugees from Donbass to Kiev, and then in 2022, from Kiev to Italy. So they have twice done the thing. Um, and you know, my experience, I have done the projects in many countries, the most similar pictures of the children in Ukraine in that war was the pictures of Palestine. I worked also in Palestine and where there is a real war in Palestine, also the facilitators are in the territory of war. And there I found more or less the same pictures as in Ukraine. Because the difference is that the war is real. And some other countries, it could be more symbolic. You have also other things. But in that situations, also the facilitators are inside the war. And that's very scary also for them, you know, because the facilitator, they will have also their families, their husbands and children anyway in the war. Then they will see the sun pictures of the children they attend so they have two times 
the trauma coming to them. So the facilitators in the war zones, they are really twice challenged. So that's why, you know, we really have such a respect for them that they are doing it because they get exposed twice to their anxiety and their fear and their and and whatever is is concerned. Certo. Obrigada, Anísia, pela sua pergunta. É... A Patrícia Jimenez fez um comentário no chat para você. Você não quer fazer isso para ela, o comentário? Patrícia? Na verdade, eu só estava agradecendo, né? obviamente, e falando que é, é muito precioso, a gente não costuma ver, né? eu trabalho com o Play faz tempo, tenho essa experiência de trabalhar em escola com sonhos, com adolescentes e com Sand Play, mas eu nunca tinha visto, né? assim, a, assim nunca tinha conhecido o trabalho uhum. fora do setting terapêutico, né? levando o setting terapeuta, terapêutico para o grupo, né? assim, para o uhum. grupo. Né? Acho isso muito lindo e queria agradecer muito a apresentação dela. Obrigada, Patrícia. Thank you very much. This is really my passion to, to invent things outside of the therapeutic room, you know. So sometimes it, it, it's good, sometimes it's difficult, but it's really what I um, want to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sônia, Sônia Martinelli, quer fazer a sua pergunta? Sônia, não tá? É, vamos passar então para a pergunta da Jussara? Estou aqui, ó. Estou ah. falando, meu microfone estava mudo. Ah, desculpa, Sônia, desculpa. Eu que peço. Eu gostaria de saber uh, quantas sessões, quantos encontros foram realizados com as crianças. Foi um processo de atendimento em sempre e se posteriormente foi dado, foi dado algum tipo de continuidade nesse processo terapêutico ou um feedback para as crianças. Sim. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, about the follow-up, I did not respond also the question before. Uh, for instance, especially in Ukraine in 2016 and the other years, they had done a very nice questionnaire with the parents. And each session, we have 12 sessions. Normally we have 12, 12 weeks, 12 sessions. Okay. We have mm -hmm. they made the, the questionnaire very precisely there And the result is that 85% of the children has improved the symptoms, which could be psychosomatic or psychological symptoms. So 85%, they have done this, this questionnaire. And we have done other questionnaires, uh, which it's difficult to do. We are doing it now in Germany uh, with the refugees, the, another questionnaire, but the, the only place where they did it really correctly was in Ukraine in, in that uh, time. Asking the parents, you know, so you ask the teachers, but that's already complicated. And so we are in the process, but we didn't do so much of a, of a really um, scientific uh, follow-up. But okay. um, we stay in the community and if a child needs more sessions, like 12 sessions, and some very like sexually abused children, they need more. And then they uh -huh. can do another cycle of other 12 sessions. Okay. Uh -huh. And some children, they did three cycles of 12 sessions, you know, in, in two years. Okay, so it's thank important, you. important that the project stays in the same place so the children can do it again, you know, with the other facilitator or the same. Mm. And did their family have uh, any kind of support too? Depending, you know, there were so many si situations. If they had the support, it was wonderful. Sometimes we made groups with, with parents. We did it in Germany for the refugees. We had a parent group and um, the, the parents, they were so happy with the parent group 
that they forgot to fetch the children after the sand play. You know, they were just forgetting about the children. They were not there anymore because they were in the parents group. So also the parents, of course, are very needy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, sure. but, but you need the resources, you know, you need people who do it, you need a room, you need an organization. So it was very, very difficult. We, we in this refugee shelter in Germany, we had not a room for the parents, you know, so uh, you need a lot of things around, you know, to do the project. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. It's a very a, a, a very special job. It's Congrats. true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obrigada, obrigada, Sônia. É, a Jussara tem uma pergunta? Tenho, aqui. Antes de mais nada, eu quero agradecer a maravilhosa exposição que você fez e o projeto que você vem generosamente desenvolvendo com essa comunidade é, vulnerável. A minha questão é, se refere mais ao início da tua exposição, é, quando você fala é, do quanto o trabalho com areia vai atingir níveis mais profundos, pré-simbólicos, no nível pré-simbólico, e que é, muitas vezes no tocar areia, a, a, o indivíduo, o adulto, é, vai se colocar num estado de transe. A minha questão é a seguinte, até que ponto nós podemos pensar no sand play, na relação do sand play é, como uma imaginação ativa? Um, yes, uh, I would say yes. Um, absolutely. Um, at least the three steps what Jung describes in the active imagination, he describes the um, letting it emerge and then also confronting it. Also that. Maybe the fourth step of the active imagination, it's not so clear because we have not a conscious, um, how can I say, so much of a conscious understanding and in, uh, interpretation. So I would say that the first steps of the active imagination, for sure, it's an active imagination with the hands, with the body. Very similar even to authentic movement also. Authentic movement is an active imagination in movement. And when you do this with the hand, it's very similar. Like John Chodorov, you know, and all that uh, um, findings about uh, how the body expresses, you know, these pre-symbolic levels. É, obrigada, Jussara. Eu, obrigada. Eu vou emendar um pouquinho na pergunta da Jussara, que eu também fiquei é, um pouco nessa história do pré-simbólico. Você falou que o pré-simbólico é uma experiência anterior à imagem, certo? Você acha que a gente pode é, é, pensar em todo esse momento pré-simbólico das expressões do Carla outra como imagens também, pensando na psicologia arquetípica, né, que coloca imagens não só na imagem visual, isso também são imagens trabalhadas? Sim, yes. of course. It's like, yeah, I, I would not call it image because image is visual, but of course it's a unconscious content through the sensation, through the body. It's more a state of being. But of course it's archetypal, it, it comes from the same level, but it's not so visual, you know? And, and you reach it, if you say to the client, if you want to make an image, just stop one moment and let it be on that, on that sensation. Then you get to that deeper level, you know, sometimes, you would want it. Sometimes you are happy with uh, creating the symbolic image. You know, it depends on, on where the client wants to access his own 
biography in a way. And mm -hmm. I find the sun place so, so interesting because you can enter so different levels. You can enter the very pre-symbolic level, you can enter the symbolic level, you can enter the metaphoric level, and you can say, this is my mother, and this means my father, and this means that. So you are on the on the metaphorical or, or concrete level, or you can be on the very literal level where the child says, this is the soldier, and these are the Russians, and these are, are the Ukrainians, and they fight. Also this level. So you have really you can like a musical instrument you can play with all these levels you know and the client does automatically mm -hmm. certo uhum. obrigada Eva tem a Marta que eu estou reconhecendo de mão levantada que está com o nome de Ayrton <risos> Matia não é a Marta outra Marta <risos> Só que você está sem som. Ela está tentando conectar o fone, só um uh -huh. minutinho, para ver hum. se vai dar certo. Yes, yes. Oi, gente, desculpa. Agora foi. É. Agora foi. <risos> Hum. Eva, eu estou absolutamente impactada com a síntese que você fez com o trabalho da Kauf e da Margarete, né? Porque a Margarete começou a fazer esse trabalho com crianças. Low infest. Né? Da, da primeira na segunda guerra mundial, que vieram com refugiados para a Inglaterra e que não falavam em exactly. idioma. Né? Impressionante. Uh, e depois a, a Dora Kauf, enfim, uh, criou o Sunplay. Então, eu acho que esse Sandwork uh, é uma síntese dos dois trabalhos dela. Você está de parabéns, recuperando o início do que foi uh, o, o, o trabalho da, da Margarete, né? com as crianças uh, na Segunda e na Primeira Guerra Mundial. Olha, estou yes. muito impressionada. Que, que trabalho fantástico, fantástico. Yes. You're right, because Margaret Lowenfeld, she went to Poland in the Polish-Russian war, you know, and she works with the children. And from there, she developed the sound play for the children because she could not speak the language. And so she created this, <laughs> this band. Yes, and I'm very happy that Margaret Lowenfeld also gets some importance because it's not only Dora Kalf, you know, it was really before uh, mm. she was... She's kind of forgotten today, you know, but uh, she she has done the beginning. Thank you for for this. Mm. É, e a Dora Kalf, na verdade, foi bebê na fonte da, Maré, da Margarete, inicialmente, né? e criou o Sunplay. Mas eu estou entendendo que o seu trabalho yes. chama de Sandwork. <risos> <risos> é outra coisa. Yes. Olha, estou muito, impre yes. muito impressionada mesmo. Parabéns. Yes. <risos> Mm, thank you. Mm, but really think of the, the colleagues who, who did it, you know, we did everything together. We made so many mistakes at the beginning. So we always did with trial and error and trial and error. So the system developed in the years, you know, and a lot, a lot was the Latin America, the Colombian and Argentinian colleagues, you know, we, we learned so much from the culture of Latin America in sound work. You know, this was very, very uh, crucial, their experience. So um, a lot of rituals, a lot of ceremonies in the setting come from the Colombian and Argentinian colleagues. Mm. Obrigada, Marta. Eva, a gente tem tempo para mais duas perguntinhas? Yes, I have. Então, só I have. você e depois o Marcos faz a última. Uh, em primeiro lugar, muitíssimo obrigado pela sua palestra. Eu estou muito emo emocionada 
eu fiz uh, sampley muitos anos com Fátima Gambini, que trabalhou diretamente com a Dora Kaff. Ah. E, e yes, essa... I know Fátima. I have known her very well, Fátima. Yes. E essa sensação que você relata do toque da areia me lembrou também que eu trabalhei muitos anos com cerâmica e o toque com, o, o, com, a, com a argila também provoca uma emoção muito, muito forte. Então, muito obrigada pela sua palestra. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. This would be another topic, you know, one could say a lot of that also, the wet sand and the mud and the water and yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Obrigada. Sonia. Thank you of mentioning Fatima because Fatima was really very important in Brazil as a sound play therapist. So. <clears throat> yeah, foi um trabalho incrível. E, yes. e depois o, yes. o que aconteceu yes. com ela uh, foi yes. dramático, que ela ficou praticamente 10 yes. ou, sei yes. lá, ou 20 yes. anos. E ela estava em Milão. Sim, agora ela estava em minha casa muitas vezes. Nós a convidamos e conversamos sobre o play e eu me lembro muito bem. Ela estava em minha oficina, não aqui, mas em outra casa antes. E isso foi muito interessante. Eu aprendi muito com ela. From her. I learned from her too. E, e o fim da vida dela foi dramático, porque ela ficou muitos anos yes. quase em coma. Yes, I know. Ela foi yes, I know. Uh -huh. muito importante na minha vida. Uh -huh. I can believe that. Uh -huh. Obrigada, Sônia. Obrigada pelo depoimento. Marcos, quer fazer a última, por favor? Quero, quero. Posso fazer duas últimas? Ótimo. Duas últimas, Eva. <risos> Eva, queria pegar a tua, a tua, o teu relato pessoal do início do nosso encontro hoje. Do... Você usou uma expressão muito curiosa, né? Que quando você entrou no consultório da Dora, você se sentiu livre e protegida. Achei muito boa essas frases. Acho que é... Devia ter em cada consultório essa plaquinha, né? Sinta-se livre e, aqui, e protegido. Gostei muito. E você fala depois do teu bota areia, tira areia, bota areia, yeah. tira areia. E você vai interpretar como um dilema muito versus o insuficiente. A minha pergunta é, você acha que essas primeiras cenas criadas na caixa de areia são equivalentes aos sonhos iniciais? Eles, eles revelam um pouco o drama do sujeito, o drama do paciente. Yes, yes. Seria a mesma analogia? Oh, yes, yes, I would. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea to, to have this analogy. I think so. Yes, yes, maybe the dream would be more, more rich and with images making more, you know, And in the sun play, it was just the structure, you know, just the, the, the very deep dilemma, which I never overcome, you know. So I, I personally, I still have the too much and not enough. So, uh, and the dream maybe would, would the initial dream would be more, um, more facets would be, but, but I think it's, it's completely true. Mm. Maybe the sound was more showing the more primitive thing. Uh, the deepest, more primitive thing, which is difficult to change. Mm. Ótimo, ótimo. Agora eu queria te fazer a última pergunta. É possível trabalhar com caixa de areia sem se tornar um colecionador obsessivo, compulsivo de miniaturas? É possível? Sim, talvez. 
also we hope that there is a self-regulating thing also in that you know <laughs> that you have phases where you collect and then you are fed up and you don't want to see them anymore and then you collect them again so i think it's a kind of self-regulation and and also just the sand and the water is kind of a relief of all these miniatures so i i understand what you <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, you know, and we have so much fun also with these miniatures, uh, especially in Colombia, you know, their the colleagues, they were so obsessed, you know, and they said, and we need this kind of food, which in the re in this region, the people cook, so we will find this little food of that region and say, no, in the other region, they cook some other food, we need also that one. <laughs> so it, it gets, as you say, totally obsessed. <laughs> And and a lot of fun, yeah. Obrigado, mm -hmm. Eva. Thank you very much for, for, for listening to me, and and uh, I'm happy that you shared the video. Uh, that's why I was very careful about the images. I would have much more images, but I'm happy that those images are being enough just to get the idea. So. I think the knowledge should be shared just as you are doing, putting it on the YouTube. I think that's the way to do it today. Mm. Thank you. Muito obrigada. A Muito gente queria obrigada. agradecer a tua generosidade, sua simpatia em estar conosco. É, espero que você possa estar aqui conosco numa outra oportunidade e onde nós possamos, talvez, quem sabe, apresentar também resultados desse projeto aqui no Brasil, quem sabe, né? Seria interessante a gente, num próximo oh, yes. apresentar yes. para vocês as nossas experiências yes. brasileiras com esse trabalho. Muito obrigado pela tua generosidade. Yes. Tá? Muito obrigada, Eva. Yes. Muito obrigada. Yes, yes. <risos> Thank you so much, you too. Thank you. And have a good evening. And Pessoal... Obrigado pela participação, evento fantástico, ótimo, mil questões. Quem precisar do e-mail da Eva, pode me escrever, que eu passo depois. E já deixamos aqui o convite para o último encontro de Aços, na Lua. Yes. Sim, o último encontro vai ser no dia 9 de dezembro, às quatro também, é, com o Lawrence Hillman, envolvendo-se com a psique poética, polipoética, uma abordagem arquetípica. Dia 9, depois do jogo do Brasil, se ele chegar nas quartas de final. <risos> Good. Bom fim de semana para todos. Yes. Eva, dê um abraço Wonderful. também no Luíde. Até lá. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful atmosphere and joy and, and, and joyful uh, and have nice dreams in this evening. <risos> thank you very much. Obrigada. Bye. 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 Bye.